Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to everyone who is worshiping uh, together as the Congregation of Spirit of Hope United Church, whether you're physically in our uh, worship space here at uh, our, uh, our church home on uh, White Avenue, uh, 82nd Avenue and 79th Street in Edmonton, or whether you're joining us online, uh, we are all part of this gathering this morning. Um, for those of you who are here in church today, please feel free to uh, stay afterwards and uh, share in a time of visiting and refreshments downstairs. Uh, you're, you're welcome, whether it's your first time here or you've been here lots of times, whether uh, you are longtime United Church or have a different church background or no church background, whether you're feeling really comfortable in your faith or whether you're just figuring things out, uh, you're welcome for whatever it is that brings you here today. Uh, and that's regardless of any divisions people might want to put on us, like age or, or sexual orientation or ethnicity or social standing or economic circumstances. We are all loved by God for who we are, and we are all welcome here. Uh, my name is Blaine Gregg. I'm the uh, minister here at the church. And uh, I want to begin by reminding ourselves that we... Those of us here today are not the first people to have ever breathed the air around these lands. Uh, this land on which our, our church building sits uh, was covered by Treaty 6 when uh, it was first signed. This is back in 1870s. That's long before Alberta was even officially the name of this place. Uh, and the territories of Treaty 6 are traditional meeting grounds and gathering places and travel routes of, of many Indigenous people. Cree, the Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and we honor and, and appreciate all those who, whose heritage is old and long in this land and in other places. So we're grateful to be gathering on Treaty 6 land this morning, but if you're from other places or you're gathering in other places, be mindful of the first peoples who knew that land and how we are all part of a much larger legacy. The uh, life and work of the church is, is often highlighted in the, uh, the church's weekly newsletter, The Spark. Uh, you can get a physical copy here at, at the church. You can also access it online uh, through the church's website. And uh, if you want it to be emailed to you, the church office just needs to know that you would like that to happen and send them your church email. Uh, this week has lots of information in it, even a copy of the uh, update of the leadership team's most recent meeting at the beginning of the month. Um, I also want to be able to give you today your first official notice of the congregational meeting that will be happening in two weeks on March 5th. It's the annual congregational meeting, and so anybody who's interested in the life and work of the church is, is welcome to be, to be part of that. It will be held after church on Sunday, uh, May 5th. Next Sunday, March 5th. Oh my gosh, I, I was saying April instead of February the other day. I am really... That groundhog, you know, better be right. Um, March 5th. Next Sunday, which is still in February, um, there'll be uh, some information after church around the uh, proposed budget and some uh, policy uh, proposals as well, so people can come and, and ask questions and learn information about that in preparation for the meeting. Uh, an annual report will be available in electronic and paper copy uh, by next Saturday, next Sunday, and uh, there is a sign-up list at the welcome desk if you want a paper copy. Make sure you sign there, because most of the copies that we send out to people will be electronic. Uh, is there anybody else who has notices or announcements they want to share today? I know there's other things going on, but I don't want to step on anyone's toes. Good morning. My name is Vicki Wynn, and I'm the organizer of the book, DVD, Jigsaw Puzzle, and CD sale, which will be happening on Saturday. We will be setting up on Friday, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm begging, but it's close, uh, for volunteers to come and help set up on Friday. We will, I will be here at about 9.30 in the morning uh, to sort through. And it's basically putting the books out on the tables. Jigsaw puzzles and the CDs will be sold upstairs in the lobby on Saturday. 
And because we have food security uh, there, we can't set up until after they have gone. So we will be setting up the jigsaw puzzles and books downstairs. As an incentive to your coming to volunteer, uh, you can have first pick. So for a limit of three books and one each of the other. Um, but you have to give me at least an hour of time. It's not like you say, I come to volunteer, you put out books on one table and you depart. Uh, you have to, it, it, the more you put out, the, the greater the selection will be for you to choose. All right? Um, and all books are a dollar. Paperback, hardcover, doesn't matter. All books are a dollar. CDs are a dollar. DVDs are two dollars. There is uh, on the poster an incentive, so, you know, six books for five dollars, that sort of thing. Uh, and thank you very much to Judy Meinzer and Naomi Gu for putting our poster together and keeping me on track. The photo directory should have been handed out to most of you. If you came and got your picture done and you are, haven't had the photo directory yet, come see me after church. If you know you have a friend who's in here who hasn't been to church recently, can you come and deliver one to a friend? I have about six more to give out, so I'll see you after church. And good morning, Vernon English here. And I would like to inform you that the board has decided that the loose offerings for the month of February will be dedicated to the uh, re relief fund for the disaster that occurred in Turkey and Syria. And as I also understand it, the uh, government of Canada is going to match all donations, but I believe those donations have to be in to an agency by the Tuesday, the 21st. And also, the board would like to thank those who have already made donations and dedicated them to this incredibly worthy cause. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a, a couple of other things. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, the church will be hosting a, a Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper to mark the end of the season of Epiphany and uh, head us into the season of Lent. Uh, the supper will be downstairs. Uh, tickets are, are, are announced in the, in the bulletin there. They're $5 for an adult, $3 for a child, or uh, there's a maximum of $15 for the family. And that will be followed by a, a simple service of ashes, um, an Ash Wednesday service on Tuesday, if you will. And so uh, people are invited to be part of that. On the first day of Lent, on Ash Wednesday, in the evening will be a book discussion on, uh, on uh, Rupert Ross's book, Indigenous Healing. Uh, and that'll be held in person here at the church, uh, but there's also the opportunity to join in on Zoom if you would like. You don't even have to have read the book to come in and be part of the discussion. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that next Sunday uh, will be after church or before our, our annual meeting preparation, uh, we'll be taking an opportunity to celebrate and appreciate all the work that Sandra Weber has done with uh, Spirit of Hope United Church. Uh, it was announced formally last week and it's in the news and brief uh, leadership team meeting that the uh, leadership team reluctantly needed to decide that the youth uh, director position had to be ended uh, for the church to make the budget work for this current year. And so uh, next Sunday we'll have that chance to share our appreciation for all the work Sandra has done. There is a card people can sign and an opportunity for people to donate to a gift as well. Uh, so please uh, stay after church next week for that and then stay after that for the, um, for the budget meeting. I did hear rumors of that we might even be providing something to sustain your lunchtime uh, hunger. There's lots of things going on in the life and work of the church and uh, more than any of us can ever know. Uh, and so we trust some of that into the, the wider circle, knowing that someone uh, is well aware and that we are all part of something bigger than we can know ourselves. Uh, and so we light a candle to remind us that God's presence is among us too, beyond our understanding, beyond our mystery. As we're singing, please take time to greet each other with your eyes, a wave, and if, as we're singing, if someone wouldn't mind lighting the candle and reminding us that we are all 
basking in the warmth and the glow of God's love. Come and worship God, who is wonderful and mysterious. Awesome is the name of our God. Come and worship God, who desires justice and fairness. We come to worship God. And let's pray together. God, as you called the early disciples to listen to Jesus, so you call us to do the same. Keep our hearts open to the words Jesus brings and the promise Jesus offers. Amen. Joined over, oh, I'd be happy to be joined over by the stairs there for anybody who'd like to share in a bit of a, a story time. Does anybody know what that picture represents? Anybody see those things regularly? That's the icon for the Google Calendar. Now I know you iPhone folks probably wouldn't recognize that. But. <laughs> Most of the time, uh, a lot of people in our world, when they think of a calendar, they think of something they can look up on their phone or on their computer. Sometimes there might have be a calendar hanging on the wall, but I bet you there's 
a lot fewer calendars hanging on walls now than there was 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, right? I do have a calendar that I hang on my wall in my office here at the church. And it's called the Salt of the Earth Calendar. And it's a little different than most calendars. Most calendars we have go by the months. There's a, there's a, a page for January and a page for February. And it has you know, kind of a regular pattern where the Sundays are on the left side and it goes to Saturday and then it rolls around and you usually get four or five lines for every month. This calendar has that same basic setup the way the, the grid is done. But instead of going by January, February, March, and April, etc., it goes by the time of the church year. So the first page tells us the season of Advent, and it doesn't start in January, it starts in last November. November 27th was the first day in the season of Advent, which is kind of the beginning of the church year. So this is like my church calendar, and it only goes for four weeks. So it only has, it goes all the way to December 24th because the next season in the church calendar is Christmas. And you see Christmas has only got, it's got less than two weeks on there because the Christmas season is 12 days of Christmas. That's right. And you can see the color changed because the different times of the church year have different colors that we can use to remind us. So Advent was blue and Christmas is is yellow or sometimes white. And then it moves into a green season. And you can see this green season is lots of weeks. It's what you see here. It starts with a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different lines on it. Now the first week and the last week are shorter. So it's got six full weeks and a couple part weeks. And this is the season after Christmas called Epiphany. And this is where we are right now. We're on the last Sunday of Epiphany, which is February 19th. That's a little post right there. And you can see Epiphany lasts for two more days, Monday and then Tuesday, and then that's the end of Epiphany. The last day of Epiphany is the day we often have pancakes. And there's, there's a cool story behind that. And uh, If you want to find out the whole story behind why we do that, you can maybe come on Tuesday or you can talk to me after church. And then we move into another season, and it's going to be purple this time, and it's called the season of Lent, and it always starts on the Wednesday that is 46 or 47 days before Easter Sunday. And so Lent is a pretty long season too. And lots of cool things happen in Lent. Daylight savings time starts. The first day of spring, the equinox is in Lent. In fact, that's where we get the name Lent. It's all about the days getting longer. Because that's the way it was where people were thinking of the calendars. They lived in a part of the world where the days got longer as the spring equinox was coming. And then you can see we've got one week leading up to Easter, and then there's the Easter season, and what do we got in there? We got Easter, you got the May long weekend, all sorts of cool stuff. But not every, what I'm saying is that how we keep track of things depends on what we want to do at that time, right? If we want to know what times of the year we're going to uh, do things in church, it's kind of handy to think of things like that. And if we want to just know what's going to happen today, we just need to look at today. Right? We're going to hear a story a little later in church today that's all about Jesus telling his disciples to think about the days that are coming as much as they're thinking about today. And so I, I, we're all looking forward to the things that'll happen as we turn the page into something new. Because today is the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany. And next week, we're gonna, next week we're gonna start something really new. Let's pray. Thank you, God, Thank you, God. For, today. for today. And all of the tomorrows that are to come. And all of the tomorrows Amen.
Good morning. The first reading this morning is from Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain to be alone with them. And before their eyes, Jesus was transfigured, his face becoming as dazzling as the sun and his clothes as radiant as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said, Rabbi, how good that we are here. With your permission, I will erect three shelters here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter was still speaking when suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. Out of the cloud came a voice which said, This is my own, my beloved, on whom my favor rests. Listen to him. When they heard this, the disciples fell forward on the ground, overcome with fear. Jesus came toward them and touched them, saying, Get up, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they did not see anyone but Jesus. As they were coming down the mountainside, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone about this until the Chosen One has risen from the dead. The second reading is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 19. We did not cleverly devise fables when we taught you of the power and coming of our Savior Jesus Christ. We ourselves saw the majesty of our Savior. For Jesus was honored and glorified by our Creator God when the voice of the majestic glory spoke out. This is my own whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. We heard this ourselves, this voice from heaven when we were with Jesus on the holy mountain. Moreover, we have the prophetic word, which is even more certain. Depend on it for your own good as a light shining in the dark until first light breaks and the morning star rises in your hearts.
Let's pray. Gracious God, as we hear the stories of the experiences of the faithful, we are invited to think about our experiences of spirit that motivate us to, to be followers of something greater than ourselves. Amen. Now, I am of a pre- GPS generation. I grew up looking at paper maps. Yeah. You hear that? Yeah. Yeah. I would stare at them for hours in the back of the car on vacation. You know, I loved, you know, kind of looking and figuring out where we were. And, and I remember my dad would say, okay, what's the next town we're coming to? And I remember one time uh, on our trip to BC, uh, still driving to Alberta, heading down Highway 2, I said, next town is Neetook. And my dad goes, Neetook? I never heard of Neetook. But it was on the map. Uh, apparently it's a, a region south of Bowdoin on Highway 2A. I don't know if there was ever a town there, but it's a region, like it's a district of some kind, and it was on the map. But I've never seen a sign for it or anything like that. Apparently there's a, like a grassy airport near still remember, what? What's that map saying? I, when I was first driving, I would study the map of the city of Edmonton, where I grew up. And I would learn the neighborhoods and figure out all the different places to go. And I was telling uh, my family this morning that I would, I would go for drives and kind of put into my eyes the places I'd seen in the map. Of course, my dad, you know, taught me a good lesson when he asked me one time, well, how much gas is left in the car? And I went, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and the end result is that where I am right now, I have this database of aerial views of the places that I know in my head. Now, that might just be my way of processing information. But when I'm, if I'm familiar with the place, I can picture it like I'm looking at a map. Now, my 20-something kids, I don't even know if they have ever read a map, a paper map. Uh, I'm not anti-GPS, quite far from it. In fact, I love using my GPS, uh, particularly when it, uh, because it can often tell you how long it'll take you to get to some place. Even if I know the way, it's nice to know when I'll get there. And what the GPS does is it gives us detailed directions, exactly where to turn. You can even turn the GPS's computer voice on and it'll say, hello, you should turn left 20 meters. <laughs> Whatever voice it has on the <laughs> It tells you exactly how long, how long it'll be till the next corner. It tells you what lane to be in. It tells you how long it's gonna take. It even will give you the current traffic if you're set up so to do that. But what it does, though, is typically it only shows me one step of the journey. I mean, you can set it up where you can look at the whole picture and watch where your little dot is as it's going. But most of the time, you set it up so you know where the next corner is. So really, you only know from here to the next time to do something a little bit differently. I have to be on a need-to-know basis. I'm just going to have to trust the system that it knows where I want to go, that I punched in the numbers correctly, uh, and I'll just go corner by corner. For me, when I look at, look at a map, I imagine that I'm going there. I imagine what it would be like uh, exploring. Now, I don't use paper maps much anymore at all. I'm not even sure if I have a paper map that's current for, for any place. But, but even on a, on a map, uh, application on my phone or my tablet or on the computer, I often zoom out and look at the bigger picture in the same way I used to when I looked at paper maps. And I love to imagine wandering around those new places. And if I get a chance to go there, my experience of looking at the map gives me some hints of where to go. Jesus, John, James, and Peter retreated together up a mountain. And while they're there, Jesus' appearance changes. 
they describe Jesus' face as shining, like it was illuminated. And they wouldn't have thought about it, but maybe it was like a spotlight so bright that it was kind of diffusing some of the details of Jesus' face, and all you could see was the shape and the light. They even described that Jesus' clothes had a similar kind of appearance. It's like they had changed to the brightest white you could imagine. And then, as we heard in the story, these four are joined by two others, and Peter is able to identify them as Moses and Elijah. We don't know why Peter knew that's who they were. And Peter says, well, I'll be a good host. I'll set up some extra tents for our two unexpected Yes, but before they can respond to Peter's suggestion that they set up some more tents, it gets cloudy, and a mysterious voice is heard from within the cloud, this is my own, my beloved with whom my favor rests. Listen to this voice. It's very similar to the voice that is said to be heard at Jesus' baptism. In fact, if you look back in Matthew and go to the baptism story, it's the identical phrasing. This is my own, my beloved, on whom my favor rests. What's added in the mountaintop story is that invitation to listen to Jesus. And because this year we focused on the Magi, the the wise one's journey on January 8th, We skipped Jesus' baptism story this year. And so we didn't get to hear that as directly this year as we will in many other years. Uh, But the lectionary bookends that season of epiphany, that green page on my calendar, it bookends the season of epiphany with those two mysterious and similar voices. This is my own, my beloved, on whom my favor rests. And both at the river and on the mountain, Matthew uses the third person, presuming that others are able to hear the voice as well, not just Jesus, not just one person. And so the gospel writer definitely, by putting that text in there, wants us all to hear that voice in the story. This is my own, my beloved, on whom my favor rests. And at that moment, the disciples on the mountaintop are just overcome with fear. They realize that there is something much more powerful than them in their presence. They feel maybe a little bit like like, uh, Wayne's world, Wayne and Garth. We're not worthy. You know, the Bible tells us that, that they put their heads down, they fell on the ground. You can imagine them covering their eyes. We're not worthy of being in this presence. And the next thing they experience is Jesus' hand on their shoulder. And when they feel that familiar hand and Jesus' voice saying, don't be afraid, they open their eyes. The cloud is gone. Moses and Elijah are nowhere to be seen. And Jesus looks like Jesus always did. The dazzling white is gone. While they're on their way down, back into the valley, Jesus gives them one more instruction. Keep this vision secret until later. Keep this vision secret. That must have been incredibly hard. Put yourself in in John and James and Peter's position. You've just had this amazing share experience and you're probably talking to each other and saying did you see what I see did you hear the voice Uh, that what you know did you know that that was Moses how do we know that was Moses and then it was all gone it must have been hard to keep it only to themselves but then that voice had instructed them to just listen to Jesus Jesus is saying keep it a secret for now The disciples did not stay at the sight of the vision. The hymn that we're going to sing right after uh, my, my comments here is going to have a verse that says, Peter wanted to build a shrine. 
and, and that's a little hard on Peter. I think. It's not really in the Bible story that he wanted to build a shrine there. He simply wanted to be hospitable. I think Peter assumed that Moses and Elijah were going to stay there with them. And they had plans to stay, so why don't I set up special tents for them? I'll give Peter the benefit of the doubt. It wasn't to, to stay there forever. It was simply to be hospitable. But the point is still kind of the same when we say, well, Peter wanted to build a shrine. The reality was that the mountain was not the destination. It was a detour. It was a side trip. The part of the story that really grabs me is, is that last verse. Don't tell anyone. Uh, biblical scholars sometimes refer to this as the messianic secret. It occurs a few other times in the, the biblical texts. You have knowledge of the Messiah in your midst, but don't talk about it. And uh, sometimes I wonder why that would have been the instruction. Maybe it was, that, well, you're just not ready to understand, or, or others won't be ready to understand you, or, or uh, don't blow the ending, uh, you know, let, let no spoilers. Um, or maybe it was, you need to sit with this for a while. You need to reflect before you start talking about it. I mean, nowadays, if you have an opinion, you have a, a initial thought, you can click on your phone, you can go onto the app, and you can say, hello world, you may not know me, but this is what I think about this. I don't have all the facts yet, but I'm gonna put it out into the ether here, and we can all think about it. Don't talk about this until later. Let it soak in. Discern what you've gone through. Share thoughts with each other. Yeah, bounce them off each other. Know that you've got this small circle that you can work this out with. But let it soak in. Figure out what it means. Figure out what it means as we're going down the hill, as we go through the next several days, as we go through the next months. Illuminate on that experience. Shine some light onto it. Look at the edges of it. Figure it out. As we're moving into new times and new experiences, take that experience along with you and see how it fits. The new places and the new experiences that we're going to go to might shed light on what happened. It might not simply be something that sits by itself on that mountaintop. It might fit into something bigger. The reality is, is life is not a series of stops and starts that are evenly lined up in a very linear way. Life is a series of overlaps. One experience doesn't have to end before the other experience is going to start. And we can walk and we can chew gum. And we don't always get to see the bigger picture of where our experiences are going to lead us. Sometimes we only get to see what's right in front of us. Sometimes we only have that GPS view. What's the next corner going to be? And so we try and balance that bigger uncertainty with the opportunity to focus on where we are right now. Now, there are occasionally events that are, are so significant that they forever change us. You know, maybe we learn something. We, we take a course. We go to school. We read something. We learn, and it changes us. We, sometimes we move from one place to another, and that change of a location teaches us something new where we assume that it was always a certain way because that's the way it was done where I was and now I come somewhere new and I learn something. People are born into our lives. People die from our lives and they change us. Relationships start. They end. And those experiences change us. And then there's all the world events that happen around us. Even within the lifetimes of people in this room, we've got people who would have been alive during the Second World War, during the assassination of John F. Kennedy, during the Challenger disaster on 9-11, experiencing the shutdowns of COVID. Wonder what's next? What's the GPS gonna say next when we turn the COVID corner? What's next? What's the next big experience that might collectively be part of all of our subconscious? Things affect our outlook. 
things look different when we look at them in the context of passing time. And I think maybe that's a little bit about what Jesus was getting at. Don't just go blabbing about this experience yet. Sit on it for a while. Put it in the context of things that are still going to happen that you haven't experienced yet. When I think about the experience of residential schools in the Canadian context, how over the last many years there's been increased public awareness, even though this was something that was a significant part of our history for 150, almost 200 years. And within the United Church, I remember the 1986 apology for sort of our, our role in the colonial uh, settlement of Canada. I remember the 1994 moderator's apology on the residential schools specifically. I remember the lawsuits that involved our church. I remember the church setting up the healing fund and settling lawsuits. I remember the Truth and Reconciliation Commission from 2008 to 2015, even attending myself some of the sessions when it was held in Edmonton here. And of course there was the very public discovery of unmarked graves last year that brought it into many people's consciousness who hadn't thought about it before. These collective experiences change us and it changes how we look at the world. I mean, just if you think about the, the residential schools, just imagine the impact on communities and households when there's no children around for huge parts of the year. And do you, hate, do you behave differently when there are children in the room? Do you speak differently? Do you watch what you say? Do you watch what you do? Imagine entire communities not having to worry about how the children are going to interpret what we do. Imagine dealing with the sudden loss of family. On Wednesday evening, people are invited to come and talk a little bit about that. You don't even have to have read the book because we can put our own experiences into reflection that messianic secret. Don't, don't think you've got it all figured out yet. Reflect. Be patient. But eventually, the story and its impact will become part of who we are. And it'll simply be part of the story that we tell. Both the up-close, the next-step view, and that wide overhead view have value. Reflect on the details of the moment that we are in and how it fits into a larger whole. Even the tragic is important for us to consider. And we are changed by the significant experiences that we have, whether they are own experiences or experiences in the context where we live. I hear Jesus saying, allow change to happen. Learn, change, grow. You know, that might even be the right order. You know, when you put your congregation's goals together, you said, we're gonna learn, we're gonna change, and we're gonna grow. We're about to enter this new season of Lent, a time often set aside for critical reflection, for preparation for what's to come. It's not necessary, and it's maybe not even that desirable to have it all figured out on the mountaintop and then go back into the valley. We are invited to learn and to change and to grow as we go. Let's pray. Holy God, may our senses be tuned to where we are, that we take in the information and see how it affects what we believe, what we hope for, and how we will live. Amen.
Let's join in prayer. God of wonder, mysterious God, sometimes we are clouded in how we experience your presence. Sometimes it feels distant and far off, and sometimes it's as close as the thing right in front of us. You invite us, God, to listen to the teachings and mimic and model our lives on the life of Jesus. To be people focused on love and commitment, to be focused on something greater than ourselves. And we are grateful, we are grateful, God, for those times when we are unsure, because you give us the time to, to help figure out some of the details of how life and faith interact. As a community of faith, God, we support and care for each other and for strangers. We believe that we are no more worthy of your love and your care than anyone else. We think about those within our lives, within our church, who may need special prayers, whether they're facing some uncertainty or the length of winter is a challenge, whether they're facing a particular personal concern about health or finances or, or relationships. God, may we be a supportive circle around each other, even when we don't know the details. And God, we are part of a, of a level of concern that reaches beyond those we know. The strangers we might pass in the street, they are worthy as we are. We think about those who are living in areas of natural disaster, earthquakes, floods, rising sea waters, changing climate. We think particularly of the people of Syria and Turkey. We pray, God, for those who are in areas of, of human-caused disaster, whether it's by an oppressive or indifferent governing class, whether it's because there is physical violence in war or terror, we pray, God, that there will be soft hearts that see your peace, that see the peace between people that does not know a name become real and manifest and the next good experience that rolls into people's lives. All this we pray in, in Jesus' name and we put our voices together in song as we pray Jesus' family.
take a few moments in our service to share some of the offerings that people have brought to support the life of the church. Uh, we're reminded of all the ways that we are uh, this day. We're going to hear a, a story of the life and work of the wider church of the United Church. Uh, and also, you can sign up to help out on Sunday mornings if you would like. You could be the scripture reader. You could read the uh, minute uh, moment for mission as well. Let's hear the story of our This morning's Moment for Mission is entitled, Women Empowerment with MECC in Jordan. Women are half of society. Many countries in the world are making efforts to integrate women into all productive and economic sectors. And yet, recent security concerns, geopolitics, as well as the impact of the COVID pandemic on global health, have negatively impacted women's lives, especially in the Middle East, a region that has seen increasing crises. In the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, government statistics shows that the unemployment rate among women increased to 31.5% in the first quarter of 2022 compared to 2021. Our, our world in data shows that women's economic participation in Jordan decreased by 3.4% in 2021 after it recorded the highest rate of almost 17% in 2017. Jordan also hosts one of the largest refugee po populations in the world. To address this, Middle East Council of Churches, MECC, offers a breadth of programming to support women, particularly those in the most vulnerable situations, to enhance and develop their skills. One of those programs is a sewing course that offers training to increase access to job opportunities. This training aims to empower women to support themselves and their families towards a more sustainable future. 20 Jordanian, Iraqi, and Syrian women, many of whom are refugees, are participating in the sewing course. They learn new skills, such as how to use sewing machines and different sewing techniques. The initiative strengthens women's leadership skills as well as they are accompanied by women trainers who themselves were participants of a previous phase of the sewing training course. In January 2023, MECC in Jordan began a sewing training course for a new cohort of learners. Through these training programs, MECC helps to strengthen women's roles in decision making and promote equality and justice for all. Pray together. Use our gifts, gracious God, to shine the light into the cold and closed places of our world, that new paths might emerge and we might find new ways to share your love with others. Amen.
are on our way down from the mountaintop. We reflect and let it sink in and we make it part of our story. Let us go in peace to love and serve all of God's people. Amen. Amen.